hi there beloved welcome to this video and we will continue with our um, study about the glorious and powerful return of Jesus Christ of course from different angles especially what will happen with his people Israel and how we he will deal with the enemies this was the last slide let's read and then we continue we read in Zechariah 13 verse 8 and it will come to be that in all the land offering is Yahweh two deficients in it shall be cut off and shall deceased yet the third shall be left in it again of all the Israelites in the land two thirds will be killed and one third will be left but what will happen with the one third let's go on verse 9 and I Yahweh says I will bring the third this one third into the fire figure of speech of the fire of chastisement of course and I will refine them also judgment I will refine them as silver is refined and I will test them as gold is tested it shall call in my name and I shall answer it I will say my people is it and it will say Yahweh is my Elohim talking about the third that will be not killed okay oh that will not be killed sorry Zechariah 13 14 uh, chapters 13 and 14 that speaks of the people of Israel experiencing a variety of horrific circumstances during this period oh boy and they will be horrific it will be unbelievable only one third will survive and Zechariah then states that half of the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go into cap captivity so this means half of the third will be taken in captivity into a captivity whereas the other half will remain in the city uh, that's chapter 14 verse 2 let's read yet it's scripture says yet i will gather all nations to jerusalem for battle zechariah 14 2 and the city will be seized and the houses rifled and the women they shall be ravished and half the city will go forth into deportation yet the rest of my people they shall not be cut off from the city and verse 4 14 verse 4 and his feet will stand in that day on the mount of olives which is adjoining jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives will be rent in half from east and to west by a very great ravine or yes ravine and half of the mountain will remove northward and half of it southward whoa that will happen literally and I can tell you already and we will see that later on in the study that the things that are described over here in verse 4 as, uh, especially they are not chronological Th this is not in a chronological order the order is different so these are bits and pieces let's say uh, puzzle pieces of events that will happen but in a different order than the chronolo uh, chronological one okay so uh, just for you and during the study hopefully you see that better so despite its unusual nature a significant aspect of this text is to offer solace ensuring that even amidst great, uh, great uh, losses even amidst great losses a surviving group will en endure to secure Israel's salvation so this is also solace I would say also because it is terrible for sure indeed but it's also for a to, to a certain extent solace because God makes sure 
that a remnant stays. That's the point. A surviving group will endure to secure Israel's salvation. A considerable portion of the Israelite, uh, Israelite population will flee and seek sanctuary in the desert. When will they flee also? First of all, they will flee at the time that they see the abomination of desolation, what Jesus warned about in Matthew 24. Then they will flee to the desert. But some will not flee, or they, they will underestimate it. But then, the moment just before Jesus' return, there will be a huge earthquake. And that earthquake will rent the Mount of Olives in half. And the Mount will be split uh, northward and southward. And there will be a huge ravine in the middle, of course, in the split. And people will flee in that ravine to the east, from the west to the east, to Jordan, to the wilderness in Jordan. So people will flee, definitely, uh, through that ravine. But as you can imagine, then Jesus didn't return yet. And we will see that later in the story. But just to, to be logical with you here. Jesus will return, but if they know that Jesus is coming to save them, why are they fleeing <laughs> through the uh, through the ravine? Why are they fleeing? Because they don't know yet that Jesus comes. That's the point. So they think terrible uh, uh, earthquake, but this is our opportunity to flee. So they flee. That's the point to the to the other side of the country and to Jordan. Okay, so. They will flee and seek sanctuary in the desert. Subsequently, upon Jesus' return, then he will lead them back to the sacred land from this refuge. And of course, all the other ones who are held, in ca who are held captive, of course, as prisoners of war. Ultimately, after safely repatriating numerous exiles and captives to their homeland, the Lord will also gather many others dispersed across the whole earth by means of his messengers. So again, the events that are described are quite often not in chronological order. Okay. So why does the Lord choose to lead many of his followers to the desert first of course it's logical while wilderness the word wilderness in our translation as an example may evoke images of lush forests scripturally it's not true however scripturally it signifies scripturally it signifies a desolate barren desert far from civilization's comforts. The harshness of the desert's landscape symbolizes a profound spiritual lesson emphasized in the scriptures, the necessity to depend solely on God. And of course, each one of us can testify to that, right? Because spiritually, we've more than once taken into the desert right so we know about it spiritually speaking surviving in the desert is a testament to god's grace where yahweh abundantly provided israel as his people with essential sustenance like manna quail water and protection this divine provision was so extraordinary that for 40 years long their clothing remained intact without wearing out. Deuteronomy 29.5 Without God's compassionate care, support and saving intervention, Israel would not have survived the harsh conditions of the desert. You agree with me there, I hope. Additionally, the desert serves as a place of refuge and sanctuary during times of significant peril. Because the desert is so hostile to human life, it was most often avoided, obviously. At, at, I, I will be the first one, normally. 
the desert either toughened or broke those who dwelt there. The desert is the place where the Lord tests, chastises, and matures his people. Oh, for sure. Oh, yes. It is also a place of repentance. The desert is also the place of encounter. Think about not only Moses and his people, Israel, but think about Paul, the Apostle Paul, and the risen Christ Jesus in Arabia for three years, where he got all his, um, his teaching, so to speak. Many men of God went into the desert to encounter God. It was also in the desert when Moses encountered the, bur the burning bush, of course, in Exodus 3. Israel had a profound encounter with Yahweh where, of course, at Mount Sinai when the law was given. And in Arabia, likely, I believe, at Sinai, Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul, received his evangel directly from the risen Christ Jesus following his transformation. This event is detailed in Galatians 170, oh, sorry, 117, 17, 4, 25, and 2 Timothy 2, verse 8. Additionally, in the context of the end times, the wilderness will hold significance for the Israelite remnant, of course. It will serve as a sanctuary where they will seek re refuge, experiencing the, mirac the miraculous profession and protection of the Lord once again. There in the wilderness, they will once more encounter Yahweh, the God of their salvation. There they will experience the repentance necessary for their final and ultimate restoration and of being born again of course where then do the scriptures teach this hmm. jeremiah 30 clearly points to the desert of the exodus as the place where israel's final restoration will begin after his terrifying prophecy concerning the time of Israel's unparalleled tribulation in the last days, Jeremiah declared that Israel's survivors will find a place of refuge in the desert. Okay, let's take a read. Jeremiah 31, verse 1 through 2. In that era, offering is Yahweh, I shall become Elohim to all the families of Israel, and they shall become my people. Thus says Yahweh, the people, survivors of the sword, found grace in the wilderness when Israel journeyed to find her respite. Or respite. The initial statement regarding all the families of Israel becoming God's people refers to the ultimate restoration of all 12 tribes from both the northern and southern kingdoms uh, into one united people of Israel. So this is not only about the two tribes of Judah and the 10 tribes of, tribes of Israel called Ephraim. No, this is all 12 tribes. Those who survived and escaped the invading armies of the Antichrist, the well-known word, let let's me call him the beast also, he, they will find grace in the desert wilderness. The context of when this will happen is when Jesus returns. Jeremiah 31 verse 3, From afar Yahweh appeared to him, I love you with an Ionian love, therefore I draw you with benignity benignity the lord himself will personally appear to those in the desert roughly a hundred years previous isaiah had said essentially the same thing in chapter 32 verse 14 through 16 for the citadel it will be abandoned 
the clamorous city, it will be forsaken. We are talking Jerusalem, right? Fort and lookout, such will become caves into the future, unto the eon, an elation of onagers, pasture for droves, until the spirit from the height shall be emptied out upon us. Then the wilderness will become cropland, and cropland shall be accounted as wild wood. And then right judgment will tabernacle in the wilderness, and righteousness it shall dwell in the cropland. And this is a promise to the people of Israel predominantly, of course. Yet another century later, the prophet Zechariah would also describe this time in Zechariah 12 verse 10. Yet, he says, uh, Yahweh, I will pour out on the house of David and on the dwellers of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplications, and they will look to him whom they stepped, and they will wail over him as the wailing for an only son and they will grieve bitterly over him as one grieving bitterly over a firstborn. Jeremiah and Zechariah both describe exactly the same event. Here in Zechariah, of course, the, the, the part of the spirit pouring out and the wailing and the grieving is being emphasized extra. But it will be one heck of a repentance. Oh boy, oh boy. But we will come to that later in this study also, of course. The Israelite survivors who fled into the desert wilderness will encounter the Lord and receive grace. This same theme of restoration is repeated later in the book of Revelation. However, this glorious restoration doesn't occur until after the Israelites have been brought back to the land. Then, this then ushers in the millennial reign of Jesus. So after the whole um, uh, set of events with regard to restoration, gladness, um, a regathering, etc., etc., also the wedding feast, uh, we will also go through that quickly. Um, then, of course, the millennial reign of Jesus will be ushered in. So it will be grand on earth. Let's read it, uh, this slide first as the last one, and then we will continue in the next video. Jeremiah 31, verse 4 through 5, where it says, I shall build you again, says Yahweh. And you will be rebuilt, virgin Israel. Again you shall ornament your tambourines, and you will go forth in the chorus of merrymakers. Again you shall plant vineyards on the hillsides of Samaria. Those who plant will plant and, will br and bring them to general use. So after the initial deliverance of the remnant in the desert, then Jesus will bring the surviving remnant of his people throughout the world back to Zion. Several passages throughout the prophets describe this la larger regathering from all over the world, but we will take a look uh, at that passage or those passages in the next video. So thank you for watching again and uh, hope to see you next time. Goodbye.